morning, church. Welcome to worship this morning. We're so glad to have you with us on this bright and beautiful summer morning. If you are visiting with us for the first or second time or you have some questions to know about who we are, please stop by the bright orange wall you passed on your way in. There'll be someone to answer your questions. And some of you have been asking about Hannah Collins, who is our connection coordinator, who's usually out by the bright orange wall. And she did have her baby. It's a little boy named Cedar. So uh, if you want to see his picture, it's actually posted on her door in the office. So if you want to wander into the office, you can take a look at Cedar. So congratulations to the Collinses. Uh, and then we also have one of our uh, core values is to invite first and next steps with Jesus. And there are a lot of next steps that uh, are available that I want to let you know about. Things that are happening uh, throughout the summer. Today, right after this service at 10.30, uh, the Parents of Grace Summer Book Study is starting. So uh, if you are a parent or you know some parents who would like to be part of that, child care is available during that time. And the books are right up at the front desk. Uh, so you can grab a, a book. It's uh, Joining Jesus as a Family is the book that uh, they're reading. And this is going to be for five Sundays at 10.30 out on the picnic tables out there. If you have any questions, if you want to just jump in today, just ask Britta for details out in the commons, uh, or just go to the picnic tables today. That's starting. Also starting today is our annual school tools drive. Uh, this is something that we've been doing for many years, and it's a real blessing to our local community and internationally as well. Uh, it starts today through August 6th. That's a very practical way to show the love of God by helping the kids in our local schools and internationally have what they need to succeed in their education. This year, our goal is to pack 350 backpacks for the kids in our local White Bear Lake area schools and 120 bags for Lutheran World Relief to help kids around the world. And there are three different ways you can help. Uh, you could just give a financial, a financial gift, and then we'll do the shopping for you to fill those bags. Uh, or you can donate supplies. There are lists either for the White Bear Lake schools or for the Lutheran World Relief uh, items for those different bags. If you're doing for the White Bear Lake area schools, those go in backpacks. Uh, and so you can, uh, new backpacks we do prefer. And then for the Lutheran World Relief, some of our dedicated sewers have already made those bags, so you can take one with you to fill with those supplies. If you'll bring them back by August 6th, uh, that would be appreciated. Um, and then another one of our values here at CGLC is love pours out, and that's what we're doing with the school tools drive. But we can't keep pouring out love without being filled up with love. So we're having a worship night called Love Pours In on Wednesday, July 26th. It's just a night of worship and prayer. So please put that on your calendar if you would like. It's going to be in the fellowship hall at 6.30. And then finally, just for fun. There's nothing like a night at the ball field. And Thursday or Tuesday night, August 15th, you can experience that along with your church family at Luther Night at Target Field. The twins are taking on the Detroit Lions at 6.40 p.m. So if you'd like to go, you can sign up online or at the information desk for a ticket. The tickets are $17 a person. And uh, we'll enjoy seats together at the Home Run Porch View. It's Dollar Dog Night. There are special family deals going on that night. And Pastor Darren is going to be participating in the Lutheran Night National Anthem Choir on the field. Uh, before he comes back. And the deadline to sign up for that is July 23rd. So take a look at your calendar and see if August 15th will work for you for that. Um, and I think that's enough for to announcements. Uh, would, would you please rise as we join in our opening hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 1 John 1 tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise from the word of God, I invite you in this moment to silently confess your sins before your God. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy sent Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in celebrating this truth through our hymn of praise.
please join me in professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our worship continues with the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord. What would I do if I had $300 million that all of a sudden showed?
Now that Vacation Bible School is over, for the rest of the summer, for our children's moment in the service, we are going to be doing the mystery box, which you might have learned from other years, is where an item is placed in the box that can't be living or ever having been living, nothing living, nothing dead, uh, and uh, they try to stump the person who's doing the box into a children's message. So any kids who are here, if you want to come up so you can see a little bit, otherwise I'll hold it up for all of you big kids as well uh, for the mystery box. But to open this first, I need a drum roll. Thank you. All right. Broom. Oh, it is a dove chocolate. <laughs> Which is a wonderful thing because I happen to absolutely love chocolate. Uh, chocolate also loves me. Um, <laughs> but if, if you've ever had, who here loves chocolate? Yes, most people do, right? Uh, that there, are, there are things about chocolate that uh, it just like fires up some receptors in you. Like when you receive it, it makes you happy, right? Uh, and as I was thinking about doves, of course, doves in the, the Christian story are very important. There was a dove at Noah's Ark that was released that flew and found an olive branch to bring back to the ark to let them know that there was dry land and that they'd soon be able to move from the ark back to freedom. So the dove carried the sign of God's faithfulness and new life. And a dove descended on Jesus when he was baptized, a sign of the Holy Spirit descending to say, this is my beloved son on whom I am well pleased. So thinking about those doves, thinking about love for chocolate, when I look at this, I think of God's love for each one of us that is so personal and so individual um, because this is just a one bite-sized thing of chocolate. You really couldn't share this too well, right? <laughs> this chocolate is for me. So <laughs> uh, God's love starts by being individual and personal for each one of us, that his love is uniquely for you. This is my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. And then from that, we share that love of God with others, uh, the promise of God's faithful, faithfulness to all of us and his new life. Uh, that we remember for the dove and the, the Holy Spirit working in each one of us is a sign of God's love inside and also out for the world. So that's what this dove chocolate says to me. So I'm going to take this with me. <laughs> oh, thank you. So we continue with the reading of the lesson for today. from the book of Proverbs, verses from chapters 3, 11, and 27. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. The word of the Lord. So just to keep things fresh, uh, our uh, technical system is having difficulties today. So we are going to move right into communion, and then Pastor Darren is going to come and do the message at the end. So just to keep things new. Uh, so with that, would you please rise as we prepare to receive the meal that Jesus gave us. As we receive this meal, we remember God's faithfulness that came to meet us personally, each and every one of us. That every time that we receive this meal, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. To remember that God's love comes to meet us in these essential ways, in the bread, in the wine, in order to, for us to know that he is part of us, that the bread becomes part of our body, that the wine becomes part of our blood, that our lives are held in the life of God. 
And each week as we celebrate this meal, we are reminded of that promise that your God is with you to redeem you, to forgive you, to renew you, to walk with him. For in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please join me in praying the prayer our Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you come forward to receive today, the ushers will send you up the side aisle so you can receive a wafer of bread or a gluten-free wafer. And then to the next station where there's wine or grape juice, the wine is a deep red on the outside. The grape juice is a lighter color in the center of the tray. Once you've received the blood of Christ, you can proceed to the middle where there will be a basket to put your empty cup on the way back to your seat. Please come to the table. All has been prepared for you. You may be seated as you await the ushers instructions.
Now would you please rise? Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which you have now received, bless you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let's go on to sing our sermon hymn as we prepare to receive the sermon. Let's enter into a time of the prayers of the people. So uh, when I say, uh, as I go through the different petitions, as we're praying for the different things in our community, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, you respond, hear our prayer. So let's practice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of this current moment. As we sit in your presence, as we remember what it is to be a community of people who come together to worship you, to lay our hearts before you, to honor you with who we are. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would be at work in our lives, that you would show us by your presence, by your peace, Holy Spirit, what it is that you want to do in us and through us today, this week, this month, as we continue to grow in our discipleship to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for our family and friends, those people who are near and dear to our hearts. You know so many of their needs and hurts. Um, Lord, we pray especially for their faith. As we have bring people to mind, Lord, uh, who don't know you among our family, among our friends, Lord, we pray that you would be at work in their hearts, that you would bring people into their lives, that you would surround them by witnesses to who you are, uh, that they would continue to grow in um, openness, Lord, to the things of your spirit. Lord, we pray for those holy moments in their lives. And we pray, Lord, for openness to your grace and your leading and your guidance. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, we lift up all those who we know of in our lives who are suffering, who are in need of your healing touch. We pray, Lord, for the healing of their bodies. We pray for the healing of their spirit, of their soul, especially those who are dealing and struggling with uh, mental illness, Lord, or depression, those who are struggling with addiction. Lord, we lift them up to you in this moment. We ask for your healing touch in their lives, for them to know and to receive your love, um, that to know that they are loved by you, that they are seen by you, that they are known by you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray uh, for all of us in this community who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, those who have someone in their heart or their mind, um, that they have commended to you, Lord. We pray that you would be with all those who grieve, uh, whether the, the grief is 
recent or long past, Lord. We, we know that that grief never goes away, um, but that it comes from love. And Lord, as we mourn those that we have loved, as we have commended them to you, we pray, Lord, that you would continue to give comfort and solace to all those who mourn. Lord, give us the sure and certain hope um, that you are the one who brings resurrection life as we entrust them into your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we, we pray that you would continue to bless all of the leaders of our nation, of our world, especially those who are struggling with war and conflict and turbulence. Lord, we pray for the people of Ukraine. Lord, we pray for the people of Haiti as they continue to struggle with the conflicts in their space, with the, the lack of uh, leadership, with the gang violence of all of those things that are happening, Lord, in our world. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless them and to, to strengthen them to be witnesses to the gospel in the place where they are living. Lord, we pray that you would give them your strength, that you would give them words to say, that you would uh, supernaturally intervene, Lord, in order to make this tumultuous season a season where your love and your power and your grace shine most brightly. We pray that you would protect those at Mission of Hope Haiti who continue to work so tirelessly to bring food and hope to the people around them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for those as we are gathering school tools. We pray for the work of our hands and our hearts, Lord. And uh, we pray for every child that will receive those backpacks uh, filled with tools, with notebooks and pencils and pens. Uh, Lord, we pray that as they receive those gifts, uh, that they would know that they come from you. That they come from your people, Lord, who have seen and known their need and have reached out to provide for them wherever they are. We pray for each of those kids as they uh, receive them. We pray for those internationally who will receive the Lutheran World Relief Kits also. That they will know that this isn't just uh, people who are seeing their need, but they're your people, Lord. We pray that you would give them your grace and your peace in the midst of this time. And we pray for the teachers and for the schools as they uh, walk with their kids also, that they would be um, vehicles of your grace and of your truth and of your peace, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Darren, who has just arrived in this space to give us the message. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Yeah. Got to be ready to adapt, right? Adjust things on the fly. Thank you, Pastor Angie. All right. Well, good morning, Grace people. Good to be with you today. Good to be with you on this beautiful time of the year. Summer is certainly here. We're in the thick and the heart of it right now. And uh, I love this time of year. But the thing that I love the most about this time of year is I love being outside grilling. You, you know me, right? I love to grill hot dogs and broths and anything else. Anything that's some kind of meat, let me get it and throw it on the grill. So, you know, just the other day, uh, I was out with my family. We were out at uh, Costco, you know, the discount store. And uh, I thought, well, gee, it'd be nice to have some steaks. So let's just, let's just go into the, the bin there and take a look at some steaks. And so there was a pack of, of four really nice ribeye steaks. I like a good ribeye steak. Yeah. Took a look at it. $71. For four steaks. I said, this is crazy. This is just crazy. I know if you're like me, I mean, you're, you're out there looking at whatever it is that you might be purchasing these days, and you're like, wow, the prices have just gone up so fast and so hard. It's tough to, to make a living. It's tough to feed your family, to provide, and to find ways creatively to, to make ends meet. And maybe... Maybe just every once in a while, the thought has popped into your head, what if I just won the lottery? <laughs> Maybe if I just won the lottery, right? Hey, yesterday, $600 million was on the line in one of the lotteries. Now, if you did the cash payout, that was only $300 million, you know. So, I mean, that's, you know, kind of, kind of pocket money, you know, at that point. Uh, but, you know, maybe you've thought about it a bit. 
Maybe it's just fantasy that's flashed through your mind. What would I do if I had $300 million as an inheritance or something that I just found out today? What would I do? Well, here's what I've decided I would do. The very first thing I would do is pray for wisdom. Pray for wisdom. Because I don't know if you've ever read any of the stories of what so often happens to people who come into a large inheritance or a large lottery winning. I've got some examples of what some of these things look like and some of the foolishness that happens under these kind of circumstances. First, the story of David Lee Edwards. Five years after Kentucky resident David Lee Edwards won a $27 million jackpot, he was penniless and living in a storage shed with his wife. The couple squandered their fortune on the typical goodies that sink so many lucky winners. They bought dozens of high-end cars, mansions, and a plane. They blew through $3 million in the first three months. By the end of the first year, $12 million was in the wind. By 2006, the couple had spiraled into drug addiction, and just 12 years after the wind changed the course of his life, David Lee Edwards died alone and broke in hospice care at the age of 58. Or how about Billy Bob Harrell Jr.? Billy Bob Harrell Jr. was a Pentecostal preacher working as a stock boy at Home Depot. Got his prayers answered when he hit the $31 million Texas jackpot in 1997. At first, life was good, with Billy Bob reportedly quitting his job, traveling to Hawaii and buying a ranch, six other homes, and new cars. He donated 400 turkeys to the poor. But like many others who win the lottery, he just couldn't say no when people ask for something. He also ran into financial trouble with a company that gives lottery winners lump sums in exchange for their annual checks, but it left him with far less than what he'd won. Media reports from the Times say he eventually divorced and ended his own life. Shortly before his death, however, he told a financial advisor that winning the lottery is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. Sad stories that capture the foolishness of the human heart and our desperate need for God's wisdom. And while I have never won a lottery, I don't buy lottery tickets, I figure I've got about as much chance of winning whether I buy a ticket or not. But I can speak to my own foolishness financially. I've certainly had times in my life where I have been a fool with the way that I've handled money. I remember growing up and the, the way that I balanced my checkbook was to go to the ATM, make a withdrawal, and look at the receipt to see how much money I had left. There it is. Money management simply just simplified, right? Ran up credit card debt. Played a lot of, paid a lot of stupid tax in my life. Foolishness. Because here's the thing. Ultimately, that foolishness costs us something. Foolishness always costs. And that's why it pays to seek wisdom at any cost. That's what we hear in the book of Proverbs. That's what it teaches us. And it's why we are studying the book of Proverbs this summer. We are seeking to grow in God's wisdom, wisdom that is from on high, and to avoid foolishness so that we can better serve our neighbors. And it's so important that I clarify that. We want to clarify it every single week because I don't want you to hear that somehow by listening to God's wisdom, you are going to have a better life that's going to make you more acceptable to God. That's just not the way it works. The only thing that makes you acceptable to God is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in what he has done, not anything you do. Faith in Jesus is what makes us acceptable before God. His righteousness, not ours. So what is the purpose of wisdom? Well, wisdom comes into our lives so that we can serve our neighbor. So that our neighbor can be blessed. So that our neighbor can come to know the goodness of God. Through the ways in which we love and treat them as a reflection of God's love towards us. So we need wisdom. We want to seek wisdom. And in particular today, we want to look at some of the practical wisdom that God gave to Solomon as it relates to material wealth, as it relates to money. Now, why should we trust Solomon in this? Well, if you look back to 
Solomon's life. There's the story of Solomon's early beginnings in 1 Kings chapter 3. And I'm just going to summarize a bit of what's there. I encourage you to go read 1 Kings chapter 3 to get the full picture. But the first thing that Solomon asks for from God when he was a very young man and became king is he prayed to God and asked for God's wisdom that he would have a discerning heart to rule God's people. That was what was on his heart. He saw what was happening around him and said, God, I need a discerning heart. I need wisdom in order to lead your people. And God was so impressed by that humble prayer in hearing that. He was so impressed that what he didn't ask for was great wealth and a long life. That not only did God give Solomon great wisdom and a discerning heart, but he also gave him great wealth and a long life. And as a result, Solomon understood some things. And he wrote many proverbs about money and material wealth. And I think one of his proverbs provides a wonderful tapestry of wisdom and its connection to what I call the rich life. And it's Proverbs chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. If you have your Bible with you today, I'd encourage you to open up there. We're going to read this relatively short passage But this short passage is written in the voice of wisdom. We've talked these last couple of weeks about how the voice of wisdom sometimes has its own voice in Solomon's writings. It's a female character, wisdom, coming from from Sophia, the name of wisdom. It's a feminine noun in Greek. And so this feminine noun speaks about wisdom. And that's what we hear in Proverbs chapter 8, verses 18 through 21. So listen to these words, as these are the words of wisdom, the words of God's wisdom coming to us. I, meaning wisdom, have riches and honor, as well as enduring wealth and justice. My gifts are better than gold, even the purest gold. My wages better than sterling silver. I walk in righteousness, in paths of justice. Those who love me inherit wealth. I will fill their treasuries. What I find so richly satisfying about this passage in Proverbs is that it synthesizes so many rich ideas about wealth, justice, righteousness, and wisdom combining them and and working back and forth with them together. And one thing that really stands out is this. God is the source of everything you have, including your monetary wealth. There's a phrase that we coined around here about a year ago in talking about things related to this, and that's God is the source, we are the resource. Good. God is the source, we are the resource. That's because everything comes from God. It's all his. Life itself comes from him. Every good and blessed gift comes from God. It comes from him. He is the source. And you hear that source-like voice speaking loudly here in Proverbs chapter 8. I have riches, not you. This is God's voice. The voice of wisdom says, I have riches, honor, enduring wealth, and justice. My gifts are better than gold. My wages better than silver. Those who love me, I will fill their treasuries. It's all centered on God as the source of everything. He is the ultimate source of everything in life, including wisdom. So whether we are talking about money or wisdom or justice or honor, all of it comes from God. Listen, you don't create wealth. You manage it. You don't create justice. You administer it. You don't produce honor. You reflect it. God is the source. We are the resource. All of those things come from an understanding of what it means to have God as the source and us as the resource. Another term that gets thrown around in church especially is the term stewardship related to this. Who's heard the term stewardship before? Yeah, of course. Now that term is kind of an archaic term. We don't use it in our everyday language very much anymore. A more modernized version of that would simply be manager. 
somebody who is a manager. And there's a clear distinction between one who is a manager versus one who is an owner. The one who is the owner of a business invests their selves and their resources into that business. It's their business, especially if it's a private startup. It's theirs. They own the assets. They own the resources. They own all of it. It's theirs. They're the owner. But then the wise businessman, a woman, or based on what it is that they need, looks to have others to manage their business. So they hire others to come in and take care of them. And they entrust these resources into their hands. They expect them to operate with righteousness. They expect them to honor the rules. They expect them to handle the wealth and the materials that are placed into their hands in a good and wise way. And if they have questions about how that should be done, they look to the owner to ask for their wisdom and advice, see what rules it is that they put in place for how it is to manage it. But the manager recognizes they don't own any of it. It has been entrusted into their hands by somebody who trusts them and who they in turn trust as well with what's been placed into their hands. Which leads to the next point on the list. Those who wisely manage God's resources have rich lives no matter how much money they have. This is so important. I want to say this again. Those who wisely manage God's resources have rich lives, no matter how much money they have. You see, we get these confused so easily. We often look to the wealthy person and figure that the person who has a great deal of monetary wealth or material, well, that person is rich. And the person who doesn't have any material wealth or property, well, that person then is poor. The reality of it is that that's not how this works in God's kingdom. Because there is a richness of life that comes in knowing the owner. It comes in knowing the one who is the source of life. And the resources that he places into our hands, whether large or small, when we recognize the abundance that there is in God, the abundant way that he desires to, to share this with us and place it into our hands to manage... It doesn't matter what's in your bank account. You have a rich life. And it means this. You see, fools measure richness by what they possess. It's foolish to measure your richness in life by what you possess. Because you have no idea how long you're going to have it. And besides, it's not really yours to keep. Proverbs 28, 22 says this, the stingy are eager to get rich and are unaware that poverty awaits them. See, if you look at what you have through the lens of, well, I'm rich because of the things that I possess, you will always want more. Because there will never be enough. It's what we refer to as a poverty mentality. You can have loads and loads of material wealth a huge bank account, a giant 401k, and still have an entirely poverty mentality in how you see life. A poor life. Because you see it only through the lens of what it is that you have. And in our brokenness and sinfulness as human beings, we will always want more. That's a foolish way to approach the richness of life and the wealth that God entrusts to us. Because the wise measure richness by what they give. The wise measure richness by what they give. How can that be true? Because in the wisdom of God, generosity is just a part of his nature. He is one who gives. People talk about sometimes having a blessed life. I, I just I feel blessed. I'm blessed today. And, and while I don't think that's a terrible thing to say, you're missing something in the context of what it means to be blessed. Because in the biblical context of blessing, you are blessed to be a blessing. That was the covenant that God struck with Abraham. You will be blessed to be a blessing. You're not really blessed unless you are blessing others. It's out of a heart of generosity. 
And from that heart of generosity comes a rich life. Again, no matter what you have in your bank account. I've seen people with very little material wealth who are incredibly generous with their time and their talent and the treasure that they have and their homes and hospitality. And they live with a joy in their heart because what they have, they go, I just want to have it to share with others. And you can just see the richness of their life beaming through. In the same breath, I've seen people with lots and lots of wealth who are so obsessed with whether or not they have enough or are going to have enough tomorrow. They withhold it. They hold it in clenched hands. And their joy is gone. They live in anxiety. There is a rich life that can come to us, and the wise measure this richness by what they give. Proverbs eleven twenty four through 25 says this, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. That's about a rich life. It's not about giving to God to get back monetarily. I'm not talking about a, a, a obscure and, and a heretical prosperity gospel. I'm talking about the idea that when we live into that kind of generosity, whatever we give comes back to us in a rich life. A rich life. And if we withhold and hold it to ourselves, it comes to a poor life. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Solomon was on to something here. He got it. And somebody else who got it was the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul understood this. And he spoke about it in his letter to the church at Philippi, his letter to the Philippians. And there's a very famous verse in this passage, it's the end of this passage, that often gets plucked out of context. I want you to hear it in context so you know what Paul was talking about here related to material wealth. It's Philippians 4, verses 11 through 14. Listen to these words. These are the words of Paul. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this. Through him who gives me strength. Maybe you've heard that last verse before, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a great verse. But I want you to hear the context that Paul is talking from. Paul is talking about his material well-being. He's saying, look, I can look around at my circumstances and let them dictate whether or not I am rich or whether or not I am poor. Or I can look to the one who is the source. I can look to Christ. I can look to him and say, I have all of it. I have everything I need. And because of it, I can do any of this through his strength at work in my life. That's a blessed life. That's a rich life that Paul is sharing with us. So, how do we move into a rich and generous life? <laughs> Well, it starts by doing some business with God. If God's the source and we are the resource, then the first place that we go with whatever it is that we're dealing with in our lives is God. We don't go to our boss. We don't go to our financial manager. We don't go to any of those places. We go to God. He is the one who has it all. We go to him. And there's some business that we may have to do with God, and we're going to talk about what that business might be today. First of all, you may need to confess to God the ways that you have been foolish with material wealth. I've been there, done that, 100%. I'm with you. There is hope, friends. If you've made some financial blunders in your life, if you've looked at life through the wrong lens, if you've looked at it through a, a lens of always needing more or always trying to manage your bank account according to a lack of something, if, they, if, you've, if you've made blunders with credit cards or with whatever it is that you may have experienced in your life there is forgiveness that we can find in christ god is eager to forgive us give us hope and help us move past those things maybe you need to seek that forgiveness in confession maybe you need to seek a heart to forgive somebody else 
because somebody robbed something from you. Maybe you have been cheated by someone. Maybe you've been scammed by somebody. I've had members of congregations that I have served who got into Ponzi schemes unaware and, and wound up losing their entire life savings as they were just getting ready to retire. They had to figure some things out. And believe me, they needed to do some forgiving. It felt like foolishness on their own part, but it also was a realization that they had been robbed. Bringing those things before the Lord, confessing that reality to God, without guilt, without shame, just asking for God's forgiveness to flow into you, for you, and for your neighbor. There's a reason why when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we say, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. But we also say in another translation, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debt against us. This is the reality of our engagement. So we, we do some business with God by confessing to him. Then we pray for wisdom with the resources that God has already given us. Everybody has something in their life. Their life itself is a gift from God. And we pray to God for wisdom of how to manage those resources. God says that he would love to pour out that wisdom upon us when we ask. And we can ask. Pray for that wisdom, and then look for that wisdom to come to you in a variety of different ways. It can come from God's word as the foundation of all of this. But it may come from sitting down with somebody who's been down this road before or has some wise advice for you about how to handle your finances. It may come from putting together something as simple as a household budget. Or maybe there's a, a good book that you could pick up to help give you some, some godly wisdom about how to handle your material Wealth. There's a lot of resources, and believe me, if you're stuck someplace and you just want somebody to come and talk to about this, please give me a call. Let me know. I'd be happy to sit down and talk with you about this because I've been there. I've been there. And then finally, start living into this generous life by being generous yourself and giving back to God from what he has given to you. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, which you've already heard, but I want you to hear it again today. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. We don't give to God to get something back from him. But when living in that heart of generosity, we just start to see resources entirely differently. We have a different view of things. Maybe you've never given to a church before. Maybe that's just not been a practice that you've learned or, or lived into. Well, today might be a good day to start. Not because the church needs your money. Sure, do we need resources to be able to keep the lights on and do those kind of things? Yes, every family does. Jesus makes his family. But that's not the reason that you give. We give to start entering into that kind of generous heart that God has towards us as a way of just responding to that, saying, thank you, God, for what you have done for me. And for those of you who have never stepped into this before, I offered a challenge a couple of years ago, and a couple of people took me up on it. So I just want to put the challenge out there to you again. It's what I call the $1 challenge. If you've never given to the church before in your life, start this week by giving $1. Just $1. Next week, make it $2. Week after that, make it $3. And $4. And $5. Do it for a year. Do it for 52 weeks. By the time you're to the end of that journey, you'll be giving $50 a week. That's something. And realize, at the end of the day, it's not about the amount. It's about the heart. It's a heart that starts to think in terms of, Lord, how can I thank you? How can I be generous with what it is that you have given to me so that others might be blessed? So that the world around us can see how good you are. Start that journey. And if it's something that you're starting on, feel free to, to let me know or let somebody else know. Or maybe you want to let me know at the end. It's not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but I want to put it in front of you as a chance to start entering into that, that joy of giving, that generous heart, the, wi the wisdom of God, a rich life. There is hope today. No matter what your circumstance is today, there is hope for you. And finally, maybe you are in a position today where you are really in desperate need. You're in the right place. You've got a family here who cares and loves you. 
we have some resources to try and help you. We would love to do that for you. And it might be a humbling moment <laughs> to have to step into my office or Mike Matheson's office or Pastor Angie's office and just say, hey, I need some help. It's okay. It's okay, friends. I've been there. And trust me when I say that when we step into that kind of a relationship with God and with God's people, there will come a day, I believe and trust, there will come a day where you come into somebody's office and say, hey, pastor, I have something that I'd like to give to bless somebody else. You think there's somebody who you know who, who maybe could use a blessing? I know that'll happen because I've seen it happen over and over and over again. Let's trust God in this. Let's put our faith in him. Let's trust in Jesus as the one who is the source of everything that we need in this life, including our material wealth. Let's bring it to him right now in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment that we get to share together today. Lord, we trust that you are the source and we are the resource. All of it belongs to you. Everything that we have, Lord, comes from you. And Lord, you have given it to us to steward and manage in this life. Father, we want to be good stewards of that. Not so that we prosper ourselves, but so that the world would see the blessing that comes from you to them. That we could be representatives of you on this earth, Lord, as a sign of your abundance. An abundant and rich life that you offer to each of us through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to hear your voice calling us into wisdom. Give us ears to hear and a heart to follow. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen and amen.